Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, along with our cast of experts here on the Against the Spread podcast. And we're all set to go against the spread, and we've got a lot to cover on the show today. We're going to tear apart the last two remaining divisions in the NFC, the NFC South and the NFC West. We're also going to take a view of player props. I know people out there like player props. All the experts are going to have opinions on player props. Stay tuned for that. That'll come up at the end of the show. And I want to introduce our cast of experts, if I may, before we start. From Las Vegas, the legend himself, Jim Feist, is joining us on the show, as he always does. Jim Feist, an NFL pro football expert. Jim, how's everything going for you these days? Everything's good out here. Uh, I've been uh, displaced from my office from a con- little construction going on, but I'm still in my house and the air conditioning is working. And even though it's hot outside, uh, everything's good. Good news. Andy Isco, also from Las Vegas. Andy, I know you've been doing a lot of running around with all these major contests that are about to kick off here with the start of the NFL football season. I'm sure you put up quite a few miles on your car these past couple of weeks. Uh, on the car and on the uh, sneakers as well. Yes, uh, I'm just sure. Just running around, like you said, literally. And uh, the the temperature's actually uh, broken a little bit here. We're now down to the one the one zeros uh, <laughs> singles uh, as the daily high. <laughs> However, this week we are supposed to have the overnight low dipping into the uh, mid to upper 70s. So that'll be a little bit of a relief. Uh, but uh, Jim hit it right. Uh, the AC is working and, and the pool is filled up. So uh, it's looking good. And uh, yeah, a lot of excitement. Uh, uh, the Circa contests, of course, are filling up. And uh, you know, we've got some information as far as the uh, contest count there because that's the, those contests have the $6 million and $10 million guarantees this year. And I think they're going to hit one but I don't think they're going to hit the other guarantee. So that's something to keep an eye on. And uh, just uh, a lot of excitement now. We start seeing the books filled up a little bit more on these weekends with the NFL preseason getting uh, you know now two-thirds of the way done. Tony Mejia from Florida, resident playbook experts, contributing writer for the Sporting News. Andy threw a new phrase out there I've never heard, temperatures in the one zeros. <laughs> it, it's rather, <laughs> rather toasty in Florida, as you know. Tony, it sounds a lot hot. It sounds a lot hotter than if I just said in the teens, which would there be like go. thirteen. So I one zeros you. make you feel already hot. But you know, amazingly, uh, down in Miami here, we have never cracked hundred degrees of temperature. I mean, it's we get sultry days. We have feel like temperatures that are almost always feeling like a hundred. But we have not cracked 100 degrees on record down here in Miami. How's everything up around where you are in Florida, Tony, these days? Not bad, but my computer tells me we get uh, record highs every other day. And I'm, I'm up uh, just north of Daytona right now. So, I mean, apparently it's, it's, it's normally a little cooler than Orlando. So that means that it's, it's a hot summer. So no uh, stop the presses situation there. But we're dealing what's, what, what's the humidity? Significant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that goes word. with Andy's one zero. <laughs> Significant. <laughs> yeah. Good word. Yeah, unpleasant. <laughs> yes, very. Victor King, we know all about humidity down here in South Florida. We're going through the the, the heat of it, the brunt of it here right now. How are you keep, keeping cool these summer months, Victor? Same thing with these guys. Staying inside, air conditioning. We uh, do our dog walking early in the morning and a little later in the afternoon. And, of course, uh, we got the pool in the back. So between Victor and Sandy and Sandy's son, Bobby, not to mention the three dogs, uh, we have a good time in the pool every weekend. Nice. Terrific. That's the place to be in the pool this time of the year. No question about it. Our producer, Greg De Palma, from up around the mountains up in North Carolina. How's the temperatures up there these days, Greg? 50 degrees last night. Hello. If you can believe it. Yes. Ooh, wow. Uh, it's not going to stay like that. But, yeah, it was great to have the windows open at night for the first did time. You, did you get hit with that Ernesto? No. Hurricane? We actually got very lucky. The tip of uh, that, the way it was swirling going north just missed us. So uh, we miss just about everything, which is really good about living in this area. No hurricanes usually. No uh, you know, flooding usually. No, hur- no uh, tornadoes. Uh, yeah, this is a nice place to avoid catastrophic, no, no earthquakes, uh, catastrophic, uh, you know, emergencies. So it's, it's pretty cool. So, but any, it's but kind of like, kind of like Vegas, we don't get much either. And thank knock on wood. Thank God. I know, but Florida, you guys get a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. Well, Greg's from we, the we get a cra- occasional tremors and shakes at like that one that they had in California, I think about 
two July 4ths ago was uh, was one that was felt throughout Vegas, but that's a rarity, very big rarity. Tremors and shakes, it sounds like a number one hit in the 1970s. I'm Tremors thinking of and steak shakes. and shake food. There you I go. was going to say it sounds like a good night in the 70s. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Hey, Victor, I'm going to ask you a question before we get into the uh, into the show and into these breakdowns here. We had a, a question from a, a viewer, a listener, and he wanted to know, and I said, I'll save this question for Victor King. And it's pretty relevant because of what's going on right now in the National Football League. In the preseason games, we're seeing it. And the question is, how much are we going to see this in the regular season? And what he asks is, how do you think the new NFL kickoff rules are going to affect the totals in scoring this year? More scoring or higher scoring games? Or will the game total stay about the same this football season? What's your opinion, Victor? Uh, uh, slightly more. Now, we only have two weeks of preseason data to go by. It's a little early to come up with any sort of like definitive answer. Uh, all we can go by are the current numbers. But with an average uh, offensive drive start about five to six yards farther than a year ago 23.8 yard line compared to 29.5 yard line this season uh, our models in the database project the nfl games to be about a point and a half to a full three points higher than last year remember last year it was 43.6 was the average in the NFL. It was the lowest scoring season since 2017. It was the second lowest in the last 15 years. So with that said, I'm projecting so, uh, this season's games to average somewhere in the area of 45 and a half to 46 and a half, about a point and a half to three points higher. Uh, and we'll see as we head into the regular season. Vic, well, shouldn't it also, it excuse me, yeah. Mark, shouldn't it yeah, also yeah. be affected by the fact that, well, we hope that there won't be a rash of uh, starting quarterback injuries? Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And it's a little too early to start talking about that, that's for sure, if you yeah. ask me. <laughs> by, by the way, the other thing is with the low-scoring preseason games, well, I want to see how that affects, and we'll see what happens in week three. I don't expect it to be significant. The difference is not as dramatic as the first two weeks, something like six and 26. But uh, I want to see how much of an adjustment there is between what we've seen in the preseason, what those new rules are showing in the preseason, which I'm not sure we can take too much from, other than it does appear to go with what people thought before any preseason games were played and that is it would be higher scoring because we'd have better field position what adjustments they make in week one because week one totals have been out for quite some time and i'll be interested to see if the effects of preseason especially if this final week is a very low scoring week again if there are any things and you know because we all know much as you see the regular season intensity be amped up when you start the playoffs you obviously see preseason and intensity and time played by starters amped up at the start of the regular season so we might have some advantageous overs to look at in the first week even though i normally look under in the first week well with that guys let's get this show kicked off on the road here with this breakdown of the nfc the remaining two divisions can uh, anybody also, be considered a oh. negative uh, disappointment <laughs> i should say in the nfc south well, I think so. Okay. And the team that I, the team I have is the team that won the NFC South last year, mm. the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you know, they did some good things last year. Uh, getting, I'm sure, Baker Mayfield was a big, big boost in signing him. It was a real smart decision that they made doing just that. And uh, if you take a look also at the NFC South, this is a Tampa Bay football team that is one, I believe, of only six teams. Uh, that have made the playoffs each of the last three years. Tampa Bay and the other five are teams you would expect to see, Buffalo, Dallas, Kansas City, Philly, and San Francisco. And here comes Tampa Bay in that mix here. They just don't belong in that mix. And in fact, the last two years, even though Tampa's made the playoffs, they're only 18 and 19 overall for the past two football seasons. And the reason and they allowed more yards than they gained last year. But the reason they made this playoff list is the fact that they reside in this super soft division this nfc south division here bottom line to me is i just don't think they've earned their stripes and i think they go from perhaps the best to the worst inside the division this year um with that let's turn it over to andy isco to find out who andy thinks is the best and the worst in the a or the, in the nfc south divisions this year well mark you put it uh, succinctly this is the weakest division top to bottom in football 
Uh, I'm not. I'll probably go with Atlanta to win the division, but they could very easily win nine and eight, and possibly even eight and nine. Now the problem with, uh, although I'm looking to play under the nine and a half win total, the problem is six of their 17 games are against the other three weak NFC South teams, and you could say that for all four teams that they're playing three weak opponents twice. I do think Atlanta has the best roster in the division, so I'll go with them to win, but I would still look uh, under the season win total in that because I could still see them slipping up nicely elsewhere. Uh, As far as the team that I think will uh, be the... uh, uh, So I I guess I would say I would be disappointed in them because they are such a solid favorite. I think they're minus 150 to win the division, which is, you know, you're, you're you're looking at a team that you expect to be a Super Bowl contender to win a division at a price like that, depending upon the division. So that's one of the reasons I don't like Atlanta. I do think the Carolina Panthers are going to be a much improved team this year. I like the coaching moves that they made, the head coaching change. I think uh, uh, Bryce Young uh, has to be better than he was uh, last year before he'll get a very quick hit and uh, they'll just uh, uh, write it off as a, as a, you know, the, the latest version of Mitch Trubisky or something as far as a bad top draft choice. Uh, but I do think that uh, I'm looking again because they play in the weak division. Carolina should improve on its what two wins last year. And I would look for them to get six or seven wins, not be a playoff contender. I do expect Tampa Bay to be down this year, so I would look under in in, uh, in theirs. New Orleans is somewhat of a question mark. Their total is seven and a half. I think that's probably a good number, and I don't see them. I don't see them totally sinking down. Uh, although I'm not crazy about the coach, Derek Carr has his flaws, but there's talent on that team. So I think a seven or eight win season for New Orleans is pretty well priced correctly. And the Isco with his observations on the NFC South. Let's go up in the state of Florida. Tony Mejia, how do you see this division breaking out, Tony? Well, I like the Falcons too, but I mean, it is a curiosity to see how, I mean, it's first time coordinators. Jimmy Lake has been more like a college guy at the University of Washington. Now he's a defensive coordinator. You imagine that him and Raheem Morris will play, will work in tandem with that defense. And then Zach Robinson, who's really young, I mean, I remember him playing at Oklahoma State, uh, is the offensive coordinator. And then he'll be working side by side with Kirk Cousins, who's learning all these guys. And we've had guys that, for various reasons, have underachieved. Uh, you know, put it on the coaching, I would. Uh, but, you know, certainly still want, waiting on Kyle Pitts to break out uh, and uh, underused Bijan Robinson from last season. Uh, you mentioned him as a breakout candidate. So Falcons for sure have the most talented uh, team in the division, top to bottom by a lot. Uh, it's make or break season for Dennis Allen. So I kind of like the Saints, but uh, uh, Alvin Kamara has barely uh, shown up this preseason. I mean, he's, he's been at the games, and I don't remember if I, if I saw that he dressed out last time, but he certainly hasn't played. And so they're treating him with kid gloves. Got a little bit of depth behind him. Uh, you know, Derek Carr was better, I think, than I anticipated him being last season, but he still had his moments where he was terrible. Uh, so we'll just have to see how he – there's certainly not a lot behind him. I mean, I watched the Saints this preseason, uh, and the fact that Spencer Rattler was likely to be the primary backup tells you all you need to know about what would happen if Carr uh, goes down because Rattler doesn't look ready. And yet he's he's better than Hayner. So we we might see it in Taysom Hill, who's gotten a lot of work at, at running back this preseason. So a lot of moving parts for New Orleans, Carolina. Hopefully their offensive line is better than this year to give uh, Young a chance. Uh, but you know, uh, still the bottom team in this division. And then you have Tampa Bay. Will Mike Evans take a step back a little bit because uh, he got the contract that he wanted last year and uh, was playing? in a contract season and obviously was dominant or will he continue to be Mr. Buck, which he, uh, he certainly has been for, uh, you know, going on a decade now. So uh, it's a team that uh, if, yeah, I think they're well coached. So we'll see if they are a factor in December, but uh, Atlanta as a winner would not surprise me if uh, they struggle to get to double digit wins. I think 10 wins does win the NFC South. Atlanta Falcons, Tony Mejia, feels also that they're going to win this division this year. Victor King, what's your thoughts on the AFC South this football season? Tony, it could even be nine wins that wins this division. That's what won it last year, right? Tampa Bay and the Saints, I believe, finished in a nine and eight tie with the Buccaneers winning the tiebreaker. And, of course, Atlanta seven and ten 
Carolina 2-15. and 15. Andy, weakest division in the NFL? This is it. It's either this division or the AFC West. Uh, that is for sure. It's the only division that seems to lack uh, a real deal type contender. I know Atlanta looks very, very exciting heading yeah, into 2024. By the way, excuse me, Victor, that's why I couldn't put the AFC West as the weakest division because of Kansas City and what what Harbaugh might do. But here, yeah, when, when you're talking about a team that nine wins, maybe even ten wins is a low number to win the division. You know, uh, fantasy football drafters are the ones who are most excited about the Atlanta Falcons. Mark, you mentioned some of those impactful young players that have yet to play up to their uh, pre-draft hype, like uh, Pitts and, of course, London at wide receiver, B. John Robinson at running back. So it could be the fantasy football players that are even more excited about the Falcons this year. And I know the Bucks have won, what, three division titles in a row now? But it just, again, this is a division that lacks a truly elite team. And it'll be a very, very big surprise if, of course, more than you know, one team misses the post or makes the postseason. Excuse me. Uh, over under perspective. Um, let me see here. Andy talked about playing a couple of these teams under their win totals, but as long as you're on the topic of unders, this was easily the lowest scoring division in the NFL last year. The division went a combined 24 and 44. That's overs and unders last year. All four teams were very, very good under teams. Carolina five and twelve over under. Tampa Bay and New Orleans were both six and eleven over under. Even Atlanta, ten out of their seventeen games ended up going under the total. In fact, last year in the NFL, the three lowest scoring teams at home were the New York Giants, number one, only thirty two point seven combined points per game in giant home games. Number two, Carolina Panthers, only 33.7 combined points per game at home. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, number three, the third lowest scoring team at home last year, 34.7 points per game. Even these games within the division in which the over-under lines were on the low side, 38, 39, 40 points, went 75% under the total. You're looking for some unders, some low scoring games, this is the division to play him in this season, that's for sure. Victor King, his observations on the NFC South this football season. NFL guru Jim Feist. Jim, how do you see the N NFC South shaking out this year? I cannot hear Jim. Can you guys hear Jim? No. 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 Maybe mute. Mute. Jim, are you on mute? Yes, he's got the mute monster on. Jim, can you hear us? We need you to. Do you have the mute button on? We got to make a, a big mute sign up, Greg, and hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> he said he doesn't have the mute on, though. Like just let me take no difficulties. Let me text him and see if he gets it while he's talking. Looks like he's going to pop back in. I'd really been technical difficulties, so he's uh, coming back. Okay. On. While Jim uh, checks out and comes back in, per se, doing just that, Greg De Palma. Your thoughts on the AFC South? Can you hear me? Oh, Jim's back. Yep, oh, we can hear you. Go. All right. Okay. Um, take that out. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go the other way with this. I'm gonna stick with the team that's been winning, getting in the playoffs. Um, Baker Mayfield. I mean, we're, we're talking about a very weak division. Nobody really inspires me to get excited but this team has won three straight years they've got baker mayfield under contract he's he's a pro he's won a lot he's been around the league he's uh, matured quite a bit they've got a, a reasonably good coach uh they play tough football they're together they they you know they got some flaws like i said this is a very weak division but you know i know a lot of pro betters professional betters that have lost a lot of money backing Atlanta. Now you got a guy that's not young, 
and Kirk Cousins coming in there with an Achilles injury that he's got to recover from, and we don't know how that will go. We'll get the same situation with the Jets, but you got a little bit older quarterback with an Achilles. I'm not betting that they're going to make it the whole year, but I'm going to go with Tampa because I, I don't think Carolina is going to step up much from two wins, maybe four or five, possibly. The Saints, I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of you know confidence in them. Their head coach, I'm not I'm not in love with that. I mean, and I think Cars slipped a lot over the years. Um, I'm going to stick with Tampa. You get a, a nice price, a plus over 300. Versus laying 150 with Atlanta, who hasn't, who's burned people's money for years. So who then, Jim, disappoints inside this division? All other three teams? <laughs> Would that be the answer? I think it's a disappointing division, and we're better off without them. But you know, I'm just kidding. Um, I think Atlanta could be potentially very disappointing if Cousins goes down or doesn't fit with the game plan of the new offensive coordinator, the new head coach. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It doesn't work out. Uh, they didn't use their talent well last year, but that was a different coach. I agree with that. He was not very good. As a matter of fact, he was terrible. But um, they could be the biggest disappointment because I don't expect anything but from the Panthers or the Saints. So I really can't be disappointed in them if they don't do well because I'm expecting them not to do well. I, the only the only team that I could see being a big disappointment would either be Tampa or Atlanta and Tampa has got a little bit more pedigree having one of three straight years that comes in with a lot of confidence. Baker has sh- shown that he can win and he's been around and he's experienced. So when you look at it overall, I got a proven winning team in a bad division with a proven winning coach in a bad division versus a lot of question marks everywhere else. And I'm getting a plus price. So I'm going to go that way. Jim says the Tampa Bay Bucks check a lot of boxes inside the division this year, a lot of value he sees uh, with them not being the favorite, Atlanta being the favorite in the division. Greg De Palma, I asked you before, how do you see this division shaping up this football season? Well, I was almost going to say ditto uh, with everything Jim said. Um, and I could say that because uh, the only thing I want to add up on that is the fact that take a look at the schedules, and this is important because Tampa Bay will start their season three of the first four at home, those uh, two of those games at home are against Washington and Denver. Compare that with Atlanta. Even though Atlanta starts four of the first five at home, two of the first three opponents are Pittsburgh and the Kansas City Chiefs. And let's also keep in mind that not only is Cousins coming off the injury, he uh, he hasn't played in preseason games for a reason, sort of like Aaron Rodgers. Um, but also, uh, and, and remember, this is a different team. Rogers has been there and knows the guy who's running the offense. So it's a little bit different for Kirk to get to, to kind of get into a rhythm and keep in mind. Also, we talked about this before, and that is the fact that Atlanta is their scheme changes are just extremely different from last year, especially on offense. That's you would think it's going to take time. Now they should have enough time in this division. Maybe they'll make a comeback. So if you're, if you're thinking of taking Atlanta, I think my best advice would be to just wait because they might get behind early. You'll get better odds, then go ahead and grab them. I, I would be surprised if they got off to a really fast start, even though they're going to have four of the first five at home. Carolina, I, I, I'd like to take Carolina with those odds, and I think they're going to be much more improved, but they just it's, it's asking a lot. And New Orleans, again, I, I agree. I just I, I can't trust Dennis Allen. I just can't. I think this is his last year. Well, Greg says, like in-game wagering, in-game play, the Atlanta Falcons during the season and see what happens as they go along, whether or not they'll be value to them if they improve after what might be a little bit of a rocky start. With that, guys, let's move it over to the NFC West division this year, and I'll kick things off there. And what I feel will be the most disappointing team inside this division here. And it might be a little bit of surprise to our listeners, perhaps our experts as well. But the team that I see, uh, before I say disappointing, let me go to the surprising one. I don't, I don't want to reverse the apple cart here. The most surprising team to me, I think, is going to be the Los Angeles Rams, a team who I think can win this division. In fact, I think this team can make it perhaps maybe even as far as the Super Bowl. I realize Aaron Darn, Darnold, Donald is gone. He's retired. And that's a big, big hole they have to fill. But they attacked the draft with vigor this year. Uh, they used uh, two first-round picks on defensive linemen this year. 
But remember, this team closed like a freight train last year. In the last seven games of the season, they went 6-1 and one straight up and against the spread. What happens this year? They return their all-NFL wide receiver, Cooper Cup, who's coming back this football season. He'll pair with the rookie of the year, Puka Nakua, who set an NFL record for most receptions by a rookie last football season here. And I think there's a lot to like about this team. I think Matthew Stafford's going to have a big year, and Sean McVay may put himself in the running for coach of the year. On the flip side, my most disappointing team, I feel, will be the San Francisco 49ers. And, but not for the reasons that you might think here. I think for openers, you break down their schedule here, they're going to face a schedule that is most difficult in terms of net rest differential. And by that, I mean that over the course of the season, they're going to have 22 fewer days of rest compared to their opponents this year. That's the highest in six years. Wow. Yes, for the, for the San Francisco 49ers. So they go up against a really tough uh, schedule as far as rest factors go. They also carry the label of what? Super Bowl loser. And if you don't think that's a, a tough label to get over, just ask Philadelphia last year what that was like and all about. The other side of the coin is San Francisco finished plus 23 in net turnovers the last two football seasons. And you know the saying, what goes up usually comes down, especially in the world of turnovers. And unless everybody stays healthy here, I can see this football team coming back to the pack here. I make San Francisco the most disappointing team in the NFC West this year. Andy, how do you see the West breaking up this year, breaking down? Well, I still believe San Francisco is the most talented team in the division. And I'm assuming that Ayuk will still be with them. It's cer certainly seeming that way. But even if he were to be traded, and there's always that possibility towards the deadline, although I would think that if the 49ers are in contention as expected, such a trade would not be made. Nonetheless, even without him, I still think they have enough talent to uh, to win the division uh, again. Not quite sure if I would feel comfortable playing their over uh, season over win total, but they still have a very solid defense and they've got so many options on offense. Now, whether or not the league catches up to Brock Purdy at quarterback, that remains to be seen. Um, he's, he's, uh, maybe, maybe we see this year the reason or a reason why he was uh, Mr. Irrelevant when he was uh, packed, when he was picked. Because remember, he had a great team around him to support him and take the pressure off him. So I still think 40, the 49ers are the team to beat. I'm a little bit concerned about the uh, uh, the Rams, and I do think missing Darnold is, is 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 a huge factor because he has such a huge presence. He's a, he's one of the few guys who is a uh, you know a defensive game changer. I do like the talent on the Rams. I still have a little question about the uh, about the running game. I do like the leadership of Matt Stafford, but he's getting towards the end of a, a very fine career, so I wonder how he's going to uh, hold up throughout a 17-game schedule. He has had issues in the past. I do expect Seattle to uh, to drop this year. Uh, they've been a, cont a, a contending playoff team or playoff team for the last uh, several years. They're sometimes coming close and just missing, other times making it and not doing all that much. I do think they'll miss the leadership of, uh, of Pete Carroll, and I think that, that will translate into fewer wins this year. The team that I do like as a surprise team and a potential playoff contender, the Arizona Cardinals. Of course, that does assume a good season from what would have to be a healthy Kyler Murray. I think they got the best player, or certainly one of the top three players in their draft, in uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., arguably the best non-quarterback in their draft. Uh, I like the job Gannon did. I think Philadelphia missed him a bit last year uh, after he left as offensive coordinator, became head coach of the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals are positioning sell themselves to be on the, uh, uh, the uh, a team on the rise. I haven't played it yet, but I'll be probably playing it this week over their seven win totals. And... I give them an outside shot at making the playoffs. Haven't decided if I might play them as they will make the playoffs because it's really a very weak NFC conference as far as teams that you can certainly say, yeah, they're almost certain playoff teams. Andy Isco says it's San Francisco on the plus side to win this division and watch out for the Arizona Cardinals this football season. And if Andy likes the Arizona Cardinals, I'm going to guess later on in our prop part of the show, he's going to mention a little bit about Kyler Murray because if that happens, it'll likely be because of Kyler Murray. Victor King, the NFC West, where do you think it goes this year? Well, you know, next to the AFC North, this could easily be the strongest division in football. Three out of four teams finished with winning records last year, right? The uh, Niners 12 and five, Rams 10 and seven, even Seattle nine and eight. 
Now, what's going to happen in 2024? Seattle could take a step back. You never know. They could be a sub-500 team. But I do agree with Andy that Arizona significantly increases their win totals uh, this particular season. If we are talking about uh, totals, we may as well. San Francisco is the most balanced, consistent over-under team in the NFL if we're talking about last year's numbers. Check out their home and road splits. Their home games average 46.4 combined points per game. Their road games average 46.3 combined points per game. Definitely the most consistent team regardless of the site. I got to mention as far as totals go, the Arizona Cardinals at home last year. They are what I call the anti-Cleveland Browns team. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that Cleveland was a dynamic home under team, but a fantastic road over team last year. Uh, the, the, the script is flipped for the Cardinals. At home last year, they went seven and one. Seven of their eight home games ended up going over the total. They were tied with the Philadelphia Eagles for best home over team last season. Uh, those home games average 53.3 combined points per game. And yet on the road, they were 3-6 and six over under, only 39.9 points per game. So their home games were almost 14 points per game higher than their road last season. And in fact, in the last four years, four seasons, 32 or more home games, Cardinals 51.3 combined points per game at home. It's a little surprising. I don't think those numbers go down in the 2024 season. Not adding some impactful offensive players either through the draft or through free agency as well. I'm in total agreement with the other guys in that I think the Rams are a surprising team, a positively surprising team in this division. Not to mention that they've been a great division dog too. the Rams as division underdogs in the last five years, nine, two and one ATS, including a perfect five and zero oh in their last five roles. Again, as division underdogs. And if you're a Niners team, you're at home, you're playing against a division opponent and you're favored. You're going to want to go the other way. They're actually been a very, very bad division home favorite, San Francisco. Uh, I've got the uh, numbers from our database here. The Niners as division home favorites of two touchdowns or less, two, 12, and one ATS in the last 10 years. So you know what to do. When the Rams are taking points on the road in division play, grab them. When the Niners are laying the points at home in division play, go the other way. But I'm in total agreement. I think this Rams team, if the Niners suffer a major injury or two, or they don't get back these holdouts, it could be the Rams who win this division. Victor also likes the Rams this football season here as well, his take on the NFC West. Jim Feist, what do you see going on in this division this year? You're muted again, Jim. It's actually, it sounds like we're picking up like, uh, do you have someone else in the room with you or in the other room? It sounds like a television noise or something yeah. in the background. I wonder if he's somehow it's being picked up with his other audio source. All right, well. Yeah, that's wondering, how would we be hearing what <clears throat> what's on the TV if the mic is muted? True. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, now we, we can hear you. Okay. All right, we got you back, and that noise went away. I'll start with Arizona. I, I feel like I mean, they have a lot of new pieces there, and it comes down to the quarterback. If he can play, stay healthy, he's very dynamic. And if he's got his head into it, he's going to show that. I mean, he has shown that this guy can actually play. If his head's into it and he's healthy, they can make some noise in this division. Seattle is probably going to fall, so that opens the door to come out of fourth place into third. San Francisco might have a couple of problems, but I'm not looking for them to fall off that much. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to be pretty much a toss-up between the Rams and the Niners. 
to win this. I'll give a slight edge to San Francisco because Darnold is gone for uh, Arnold is gone gone for uh, Rams, and that's that's a big loss. They got to fill that loss. Maybe they will. Maybe the draft choices they got will make a difference. But with San Francisco in in regular season play, uh, Shanahan has done a great job. When he gets to the playoffs and he gets to the Super Bowl. He, I don't know what happens, but he's gone into the fourth quarter in the Super Bowl three times, either as a coach or as, as a head coach or offensive coordinator, and he's not come out with the victory. So I'm not going to that level now because we're just staying in regular season play. I think San Francisco eats it out, could end up in a tie with the Rams because the Rams are solid, good coaching, very good wide receivers, especially if Cup is back healthy. Uh, it's it's going to be tight. Arizona comes in third, and maybe sneaks into second if one of the other favorites fall off. But I'm looking San Francisco Rams, Arizona, and Seattle in that order. The disappointing team is I don't know. You can't be too disappointed with a team you don't expect anything from. Um, I don't see a, a, a real disappointing team here. I think three of those teams are going to do very well this year. Jim kind of likes the NFC West this football season here. He sees it falling like the odds makers see it falling. Tony Mejia, how do you see it falling in the NFC West this season? Well, I've got San Francisco finally breaking through and winning the Super Bowl. So obviously I don't think that they're going to uh, be disappointing, but we'll see what happens during the regular season. I, I think it's going to be key for them to get Talanoa Hufunga back. And from what I've seen, uh, he is on track to uh, play in the season's second month. And that first month of the season is kind of friendly. You got the Jets uh, on a Monday night at home. You win that game. I mean, there, there's going to be an adjustment period for Aaron Rodgers. I don't care, uh, you know, that, that he is such a proven commodity and, and a veteran. Uh, he's still got to deal with live bullets for the first time in over a calendar year. Then you've got uh, Minnesota where you're, you're playing on the road, but that'll be a, a Sam Darnold likely, uh, you know, his second game as their starter with new personnel. So then you got the Rams and New England and Arizona. So four and one, five and oh, certainly within the realm of possibility. And then you get Hufunga back. We'll see what happens with Brandon Ayuk. I, I just don't see them fading away. And I do see uh, losing a Super Bowl in the manner that they did as, as grueling as it was, uh, as, no, as motivation to avoid an early letdown. And then late in the season, I just think that they're extremely talented. Uh, they had, uh, Debo Samuel running on fumes during last postseason. I mean, that was pretty well documented during this receiver series that, that aired on Netflix, that he was not 100% and he was kind of gutting it through. Uh, and, and they had, uh, you know, issues on offense that we'll see. I mean, I, I think that's if, if you're going to say why San Francisco doesn't make it this year, maybe it is Brock Purdy taking a step back. Um, but with so much talent around and with McCaffrey to hand the football off, I think uh, any – let down from them would have to be uh, injury related. I, I don't know. Uh, I think Jim Jim mentioned it. I don't know that I can be disappointed in teams that I don't really expect a lot of. Uh, but Seattle certainly comes to, to mind. Although if Mike McDonald teams with Leslie Frazier to really ramp that defense up, uh, I could buy Sam Howell playing well enough to get them through into playoff contention if Geno Smith continues to take a step back or is too injured to play this season. Uh, so that leaves the Rams as my potential disappointment because you can't be disappointed in Arizona given what they've showed over the last few seasons. And I'm of the agreement that if Kyler Murray can stay healthy, they can take a step forward. Uh, I like the Marvin Harrison Jr. pick just as much as anybody. And uh, I really like what Jonathan Gannon did in terms of keeping that team competitive despite the fact that they struggled as much as they did. I mean, they took a couple of teams that were better than them to overtime. They were plucky. They, were, they uh, took some chances on the defensive end. Uh, so I do expect them to step forward. And then it sounds easy to say, but again, how, how do you replace Aaron Donald as the leader of that defense when he really, I mean, you could say he took a step backwards over the last couple of years because he was so great earlier on in his career, but he was still the guy that you were game planning for if you were an offensive coordinator. I mean, he was still a difference maker. It still shocked everybody when he said, all right, this is going to be it for me. 
So to have to replace that leader on that end, I think there's a natural regression on the defensive side. And on the offensive side, we've seen if you can't keep Matthew Stafford upright, he's going to struggle to beat you because he's got to be 100% to put the ball where he needs to, and he's not mobile enough uh, to avoid you know, pressure in today's NFL. So the Rams, for me, would probably take a step backwards. Curious to see how uh, Seattle, where their ceiling is. Same with Arizona, San Francisco, tried and true. I think they break through this year. Tony likes the San Francisco 49ers to win this division and the Super Bowl. And by definition of disappointment, he makes the Rams that team only because the other two teams are probably going to be disappointing and losing teams anyway. So check it off, San Francisco, to win the division, the Rams' most disappointing. And, Greg, I'll let you wrap up this NFC West. What's your take on this division this year? Uh, it's going to be one of the better divisions in football. Um, I look at it very similar uh, to the AFC North in, in the fact that I think all four teams uh, could have a good season. I'm not saying all four could win the division. The, NFC, the AFC North is better top to bottom uh, because they have that distinction. Uh, Bengals can easily win the division. Um, Arizona, uh, they can have a good year. They can sneak it into the playoffs, definitely, but they're not winning a division. Uh, because the division is tough. And I also think Seattle is going to be a very interesting team because uh, I think they have the talent. I actually think that it was getting a little bit stale with Carroll as much as a inspiration that he is and and has been and, and, and was to that franchise. I just think that they just needed another voice. And I think it was a smart idea to go to a young, younger version of Pete Carroll. And I think Mike McDonald might be the perfect answer. They hired a really good coordinator from college uh they've got weapons uh if gino uh can play well he's capable of it uh the defense should be better i think with mcdonald and they also have some more talent there so i think this is going to be a uh actually a three-team race like it was last the last couple of years even though san francisco pulled ahead each season and had a stranglehold but i'm with you mark uh because you know we, we definitely see eye to high and eye to eye i should say on the old uh losing the Super Bowl deal because uh, it just works. No matter how many times we go, no, 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 but look how talented they are. No, 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 no. It's like, well, it's, things happen. I don't know why, but they just do. Not It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. Um, but San Francisco is a, is a really fa- uh, solid foundation. They have a solid foundation there. So you would think that that's one organization that should be able to withstand that. But you know what? It only takes like one Trent Williams who did not report. I'm not even sure if he's back yet. But one Trent Williams injury and everything goes downhill. So I think there there are some mm. potential landmines in San Francisco that can hurt their chances. Um, and, uh, and and with the Rams, they're always going to be tough as well. So I, this is going to be a really fun division to watch. I don't think that there's going to be a weak opponent uh, in, in, whenever these teams play each other. So, uh, and if San Francisco does have a little bit of a, you know, comeback deal to earth because of losing the Super Bowl, that's really going to make things uh, even more entertaining. Greg's take on the NFC West, a good review of both the West and the South conferences this year by our ex- divisions, I should say, by our experts. And before we go to the segment, I think everybody's going to enjoy uh, about the player props this football season. Once again, I want to let everybody know that now is the time you need to order the totals tip sheet for the 2024 football season. If you don't know about the totals tip sheet, it's published by Victor King. He's been doing an outstanding job with this newsletter. Just as you hear him on the podcast, this guy knows his totals. Winning seasons in 14 of the last 17 years. Team totals of the week, about 72 and 38 guys. And the totals tip sheet features five NFL over under best bets each week. Subscribe to the Totals Tip Sheet today, and you'll also receive it, what I mentioned before, that Coffee Club e-letter in your email box every day through the Super Bowl as a free bonus. What a combination that is. The Totals Tip Sheet every week, the Coffee Club in your e-box all the way through the Super Bowl. You just can't beat it. Log on at playbooksports.com today and sign up today for that Totals Tip Sheet. It'll probably be the best move you'll make this football season. And with that, we're going to hand it over to Greg De Palma, our producer, to review our player props, largely because this was Greg's idea, and I think it's a real good idea. And Greg, as I understand, as we talk about these player props, you, will you be putting for our viewers out there uh, the odds as they are from DraftKings with, within each uh, 
within each category? Yeah, matter of fact, uh, let's see, I'm gonna pop them up here, but I could make it uh, a lot easier so they could watch us while, uh, so I'll just shrink it and there you go. So let me put it here in the corner so everybody can uh, watch along with us. This is the comeback player of the year, by the way, that we could start off with, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, I know we have Jim Feist's favorite player there, Aaron Rodgers, as the <laughs> leader. Uh, <laughs> Joe Burrow no, is, is no. not not far behind. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but I know you're not going to go with uh, one of these two uh, players. Uh, and, 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 I, and look, here's the deal. I just want to remind everybody as we're going through this, this is not going to be, we're not going to just go, oh, yeah, here, here are all the favorites and here, here's, here's what we think. Hey, look, it's like horse racing. If you just, if you like a favorite and you think that's the way to go, even though it's only plus 140 or three to one, then our, our uh, experts are going to go ahead and say that's just our pick. Uh, that would be our pick that we would advise you for. Um, but most of the time, this is about trying to find good bargains to wager on and go after in each one of these categories. And uh, Jim, uh, might as well start with uh, with your pick because I know uh, who you are targeting because it was a player that I thought of as well as your comeback player of the year. Hey, Greg, can you scroll those players a little bit? We're looking at yep. this top six, but uh, I think the viewers might want to see who else might be on that list. And there's... Uh, there's, there's there's right there kyler murray right here plus 2800 um uh, this young man has a lot of talent we've seen it yes he's undersized yes he has potential to getting injured now most of these comeback players have been injured the previous year so that kind of goes on on you know definitely there but he has the talent he has some talent around him and he got new coaching new attitude i like what's going on as a matter of fact, I'll give you a play first week. He's going up to Buffalo with this team, taking seven points or more, no less. I'm, I'm betting Arizona plus seven or more, plus the points and possibly to win the game straight up. So Kyler Murray is my comeback player of the year. All right. Next, uh, Vic. Let's go with you, Vic. Who's your comeback player of the year? You know, when I came up with my guy, I thought that uh, I would stand out from the other guys but it looks like I'm uh, jumping on the bandwagon, and I'm with them. I'm with Kyler Murray at those generous odds. You know, the previous winners were, let me see, Joe Flacco last year, Geno Smith, Joe Burrow, Ryan Tannehill, and Andrew Luck dating back to the 2018 season. What do the five winners have in common? They're all quarterbacks. Now, of course, the, trick, the tricky part is predicting which one. Of course, you see the favorites there. Your Aaron Rodgers, your Burroughs, your Cousins, uh, your Richardson, the second-year quarterback from Indianapolis. But, again, I, I'm i a value guy, and I love the odds. Remember in the 20 and 21 seasons, Murray was a top-five fantasy quarterback before tearing that ACL. And, of course, upon his return last year, I mean, he delivered top-12 quarterback value, learning, A, a new system, without a preseason and dealing with one of the worst receiving core in the NFC last year. They've added multiple impactful offensive players this season. Arizona could very well be a team with a winning record. Jim, I'm in. Count me in on Kyler Murray. Well, uh, Tony, I know that uh, you're not going to go with Kyler Murray. So is the player you're going to go with on the board here? Yes, he is. He's on your board right there. He's Matthew Judon at plus 5,000. But I'll say this, look, uh, it's it's boring to go with Aaron Rodgers. It's not boring to go with Kirk Cousins at plus 500 because that's pretty good. You get five times your investment back. But if you want 50 times your investment back, uh, Matthew Judon would be a very interesting play because same rationale. He's going to a Falcons team that I think will fare well. We talked about them potentially winning the NFC South and certainly their favorite to do that. Judon played only four games last year with the Patriots before he tore his bicep, I believe. Um, and and so he, he's coming back off an injury that is part of the uh, new parameters as to what the NFL wants to see uh, the comeback player award become. You know, somebody that comes off uh, down season due to adversity or injury or whatnot. And uh, Judon, before this season, had 15 and a half sacks in 2022. 
12 and a half sacks the year before that. So you got a guy that when healthy, capable of huge things, he goes to become a, a immediate difference maker on a Falcons defense. They also signed Justin Simmons uh, this past week. So clearly they're playing for keeps this season. Uh, while Cousins will certainly get the majority of the headlines if Atlanta does break through and he keeps everybody happy on that offense, Judon could emerge as the leader of the defense and at plus 5,000, can't beat that. All right, Andy, what do you think? Well, I'm going to try and stick to our 25-second limit. I also consider <laughs> quarterbacks. If you have an opinion in Pittsburgh, you could take Fields or Wilson. They're both at 40-1. to 1. Kyler Murray, I can certainly agree with because I do like Arizona. Deshaun Watson, if he's healthy, he's priced at 40 to 1. But I'm going to go with another 50 to 1 guy who I like. Justin Herbert, Chargers. Has the potential. Plantar fasciitis seems to be healing qu quicker than expected. And he's getting a, a very good coach who will take uh, make the best use of his talents and put some good pieces around him. Excellent. Andy, in on that 25 second rule. Uh, next up, Mark. What do you like? What do you got, Mark? Let me ask you this question. How does Justin Herbert make this list? Where did he go to come back from? I know he's injured right now, but uh, has he? Yeah, good point. He, he was injured, he yeah. was injured last year. Well, he but just he didn't, didn't, he didn't play, 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 play well. Yeah. Oh, because he didn't play the full season. Okay. All right. Okay, I get that. I, well, I could just... attribute it to poor coaching. I understand. <laughs> I'm going to stay with the rule, what Victor said. It's been quarterbacks the last five years, and I'm going to talk about the guy I talked about earlier and that's going to be Kirk Cousins for my comeback player of the year. I think he's resides in a real super soft division. He can ideally take care of this division. I think he's got a lot of talent around him. That's just aching to end up having a quarterback that can do something and deliver the football to them. This football team will be in the playoffs. Kirk Cousins will lead the charge. I make him my comeback player of the year. All right. And then uh, I will wrap it up. Or do I wrap it up? Everybody's in, right? Yep. Everybody's in. So I'm going to wrap it up, and you guys have already uh, taken some of my options away. Uh, and, and matter of fact, you uh, you hit on a couple of the ones that I was thinking about as my uh, as as a couple of my options, Andy. Uh, two of those are Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson. And I'm going to go ahead because I've said it for the past couple of months, ever since the odds came out for the Super Bowl. I think the Cleveland Browns are being undervalued, so I'm going to go all in on Deshaun Watson as Good. comeback player of the year. So, and again, uh, he's got those odds. They were 40 to 1. You could call him a triple comeback player of the year. It's been a long, long while. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. All right. Next up, uh, let's uh, take a look at, tell you what, let's go the opposite way. So let's go to coach. So we're going to put the coaching uh, odds up here. And uh, we're going to start. Uh, by the way, I know Jim, you have MVP and comeback. Did you have? Did you have just a comeback uh, and the MVP, or did you have a coach oh, as can, well? I can I can throw something in here. Let me see these odds. Um, this is coach of the year. Well, I tell you what. Why don't you take a look at them? Because I'm going to scroll through them and I'll get back to you. And this way you can well, take you, your time. I can't. I can't scroll them. You have to. No, I mean, I, yeah, I'll scroll them. You'll, you'll take a look if, at them. Yeah, if I try, it, it blows everything. No, up. no, <laughs> so. we wouldn't do that to you. Uh, all right, so uh, Vic, why don't you go ahead and give us your coach of the year? Well, the field is certainly wide open, that's for sure. There are no coaches at less than, what, 8-1 to one odds there, right? Uh, what were the oh, – okay, uh, Jim Harbaugh, Matt Eberflus, uh, Mike McDonald, the working head coach for Seattle, Matt LaFleur. Uh, now, remember our boy uh, Kevin Stefanski, he won this sucker last year. It was, in fact, his second coach of the year award. My pick is going to be a team that we just talked about from the AFC South Division, and I'm going with Raheem Morris of Atlanta. We're getting back about 13 to 1 odds on him. Of course, we just talked about it. They have a chance to be one of the best teams in the uh, NFC entire conference this year, much like Detroit. Atlanta should uh, take that huge leap. They can suddenly become a serious threat to the 49ers that would make Morris an obvious choice for coach of the year. And I know there might be one or two better candidates on paper, but between the opportunity and the odds, I like Morris. All right, Morris, a uh, smart choice there, especially if Atlanta wins the division. Uh, he is going to get a lot of votes, no matter how uh, right. 
how well record wise you would think they'll at least be a nine win team so that that would probably be good enough okay uh tony who's your coach of the year i won't have one but i'll give three cool options we've got dan quinn if washington turns around at plus two thousand we've got mike mcdaniel at plus three thousand if uh, the dolphins run through the afc east which i think is a possibility if buffalo takes a huge step backwards and my choice, I guess, will be Matt LaFleur at plus 1,200, given that uh, Green Bay is playing in a very tough division. And uh, if they win that, uh, I like his chances. I'll throw in a fourth Shane Steichen if the Colts uh, surpass the Texans. All right. Andy? You there, Andy? I, I, yeah, I, I just had a... I was going onto the screen so I could take a look at all the lists there. Uh, there are two that I have in mind. Uh, I'm not crazy about the odds. I, in fact, over at the Westgate, I can get better odds than the 8-1 uh, to one on Matt Eberflus if the uh, Bears are able to make the playoffs this year, and I think they have a chance to do so. And the other one I talked about, Arizona, they don't have to make the playoffs, but if they can approach eight or nine wins, uh, I think uh, uh, Coach Gannon has a good shot to win, and I believe about 17-1. to one. Oh, okay. So you're going out on Jonathan Gannon as Coach of the Year at 17-1. to one. All right, next up, let's go to Mark. What do you got, Mark? I'm going to stay with my pattern and uh, the teams that I think will surprise this year. And with surprises come coaches and also comes quarterbacks. And I'm going to go with Sean McVay for the Los Angeles Rams. If San Francisco does not win this division, if the Super Bowl jinx gets them, if the returning to the norm from the turnovers gets them, if the fact that uh, they just don't know how to win games in the, uh, when it comes crunch time, especially Super Bowl games, I like the makings of what the Rams are potential of doing this year. And I think you've got a real square price on Sean McVay at 25 to 1. All right, there you go. Sean McVay, really good coach. And what do you think? He, what do you think? So you think they have to win the division? And if he doesn't win the division, he won't have a shot for coach of the year? No, I think they have to win the division. Uh, you know, if they finish second, I don't think they're going to give a coach of the year to anybody that finishes second, unless it's a it's a team that was last place last year and come back and turned around and had a winning record this year. But that's not the case for the Rams. All right, so uh, let's go back to Jim. Jim, you've had an opportunity to think things over. Well, yeah, I really hadn't planned on this one, but I I've been watching what's going on in Denver. Sean Payton is a good coach. Oh, I'm surprised yeah. about this, Jim. That was going to be my pick. I'm surprised about that because you've been trashing Denver this whole offseason. Well, yeah, because I mean, they've been a mess. But they were a mess. A, they had a terrible offensive coordinator, head coach, in combination with Hackett. And then uh, Peyton gets in there with Russell Wilson. And I don't know what the hell happened to Russell Wilson from his good old days in Seattle, but he is not – I mean, they weren't terrible. They did win some games. They they were in a lot of games. But I like what's going on. The, the marriage between Peyton and Nix, Bo Nix, is really remarkable at this point. Now, granted, practice and, and, and seven-on-sevens and preseason, you're not really learning everything. But I do believe he's got, he's got the capability of turning a – a young kid into something a little bit more than people expect. I do see some holes in this division. They're not going to win the division. We know who's going to win the division. Kansas City, They, if Mahomes stays healthy, they're winning the division and probably go to the Super Bowl. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do see the Super Bowl. If you want to know who I think is going to be there, it's going to be Kansas City against the Detroit Lions. Now, that could be one. Dan Campbell getting all the way to the Super Bowl, he could win Coach of the Year for doing that. But you also could look at Sean Payton, both the same price, 2001. I, I, I don't want, know why they're the same price. But Payton, if he can turn Knicks into a player and get the second place in that division, and I think it's possible, um, he could win it. So there's two, sh two choices out there, Dan Campbell, Sean Payton. Okay. And uh, three, my top three were actually Raheem Morris, Sean Payton, and I'm going to go ahead since you guys ate up my long shots. And, and even though it's the top pick, it's still 
eight to one, which is not a bad number for Jim Harbaugh. So I'm going to go ahead and say Harbaugh at eight to one. Uh, a Michigan man taking a Michigan coach. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to go that route. And uh, it's a lot better than going at plus 140 or three to one with, the, with those comeback players. So at least uh, you get decent value here with the top choice. Okay. Uh, let's now uh, turn on uh, to the next award and we go to defensive player of the year and offensive player of the year. We'll start with defensive player of the year. And uh, Vic, uh, who do you, who do you go with here? Well, let's see here. Let's look at the favorites up there. Okay. TJ Watt and Micah Parsons. Okay. That's not surprising. Well, that's for sure. In fact, uh, when I started doing the research early this morning, I saw you know Parsons is the only player in history to finish in the top three of the defensive player of the year voting in each of his first three seasons. Of course, our boy from Northeastern Ohio won it last year. That's Miles Garrett. Uh, he's plus 800, somewhere around there, right? Eight to one odds. Yes. Uh, he was unstoppable last year. What, 14 sacks, four forced fumbles, uh, even a couple of like pass deflections. With five straight seasons under his belt, I think he's very well positioned to reach new heights this year. And I don't see any reason why he does not repeat. And, of course, that's our boy, Miles Garrett of the Cleveland Browns. Wow. Okay. Repeat. No respect for Miles Garrett at 8-1. to one. All right. Let's go uh, to Tony. Tony, what are you going to go with your defensive player of the year? I'll go with one of the two 35 to one options that are on the board. There's mul multiple ones, but we'll go with uh, Danielle Hunter from the now Houston Texans coming over from Minnesota, making an immediate impact there or Chris Jones. If uh, the chiefs don't take a significant step forward offensively, uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, all, I mean, he got everybody's attention last year because of the chiefs defense overachieved and uh, kept them afloat while uh, the case of the drops really affected all the Chiefs receivers. So uh, maybe rides that momentum to another big season and a DPOY here. Okay, excellent. That's Tony's pick. Andy? I'm, I, I like Max Crosby and I like um... – Miles Garrett and Mark, Micah Parsons, Parsons, but not at those odds. I'm going to go with Aiden. Excuse me. Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson, Hutchinson of the uh, of the Lions. Eleven to one is pretty good for a team that I think continues to show improvement on both sides of the football. Uh, he's uh, what's this? His third year, I believe, in the league. He's already made an impact. I think eleven to one especially if the Lions have the kind of season that I expect them to. And, in fact, I, I know Jim already has them in the Super Bowl. I've already played them in a couple of combinations uh, in the uh, Circa Exacta that they have, including uh, Lions over Bengals, Bengals over Lions, and uh, Lions and Chiefs as well. Okay. Mark? Well, I'm going to go uh, with Victor, with Miles Garrett on a repeat this football season here. And, uh, interestingly, last year uh, when he went up, largely against T.J. Watt from Pittsburgh within the same division. Truth be told, T.J. Watt had the better numbers. But it's what you do on the field in the games and it, when you do it on the field in the games. And Miles Garrett is a horse. I was reading where when Cleveland scrimmaged against Minnesota, a couple of their offensive linemen made comments about Miles Garrett. You'd have thought he was, they were there, he was his public relations guy. It, it's unbelievable how talented this guy is. And T.J. Watt, I think, could come with a chip on his shoulder this year, but I don't like the fact that he's favored. So, hence, I'll go with Miles Garrett. All right. Uh, Jim, are you doing any of these? Not not, not this group, okay. no. Not this, no. I'm going to go with the guy that I, I mentioned, uh, I believe it was on last week or the week, uh, the show before that. Uh, I forget why, why we talked about this, but it was uh, – uh, a, a couple of players that I thought oh, it was in the list or list last week, the players top 100 list. And I thought this player um, uh, should have been a little higher. And that was Kyle Hamilton. So I'm going to go with Kyle Hamilton, 35 to one Baltimore Ravens uh, hybrid linebacker. Okay. Now let's move on to offensive player of the year. Okay. And we're going to start once again with Victor. So Vic, uh, we got Tyree killed. No big surprise. He's, he's the leading guy at seven to one. This is one of those uh, 
weird categories where it seems like it's awarded to the top (laughs) non-quarterback offensive player. We were talking about some of the criteria before the show that had me scratching my head. That is for sure. Non-quarterbacks have won Offensive Player of the Year every year since Patrick Mahomes way back in 2018. Uh, Again, as I mentioned, it's uh, a, a, a unique award given to a player who may have been dominating on the field, but maybe was overlooked as a uh, MVP candidate. Of course, the chalk, our boy down here, Tyreek Hill, cover boy from last season's preseason uh, yearbook over my right shoulder. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, another chalk player. For me, guys, my pick is a guy that uh, had an off year last year. Both he and his quarterback did. And that's Jamar Chase, Cincinnati wide receiver, 12-1 to odds. One of the best wide receivers. He's coming in off that down year. A lot of it wasn't his fault, as Joe Burrow was injured for a majority of the season. With both players back healthy, I would not be surprised if he had a major bounce-back season. Remember his rookie season, 13 touchdowns, 1455 yards, 81 receptions when he and Burrow were healthy. Give me some Jamar Chase action at 12 to 1. All right. In the books, Jamar Chase. And yes, he is uh, having one of those uh, hold ins. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, looks like T. Higgins and Jamar Chase might be ready to have a breakout year with uh, Joe Burrow. Bust out year, I should say, after a very disappointing 2023 20, season. Next up, Tony, who are you going to go with? Offensive Player of the Year. I'll go Justin Jefferson. Team to one. I mean, a lot of these guys that we see on this list, you've got handcuffs. You've got Amon Ross St. Brown and, and uh, Gibbs are on the list together. You've got you know, guys with the Falcons are on the list together. A couple of Dolphins, even though A-Chain is somebody that's very interesting given his odds, but obviously Tyree Kill is the top dog there. You know, it's going to be Jefferson trying to make Sam Darnold look good. And if he does, it's undeniable. And I think. Uh, there's no question that Justin Jefferson is a top receiver in the game right now. So I'll go with him in, in a, a award that's really going to be an eye of the beholder thing. All right. Next up, Andy. I considered him on Ross St. Brown, uh, but I'm going to go with, uh, with Victor and Jamar Chase. I think he, despite a down year, he still uh, had a very, uh, very productive season. And again, that was some games with, uh, without Burrow in there. I just think he, uh, the quarterbacking will be the difference between the two, even though I like Detroit a lot and I do have them as a, uh, a solid Super Bowl contender. I think Chase is just a, uh, a spectacular receiver, and I'm looking for, you know, again, if Burrow's healthy, um, <coughs> he's the guy. Mark? I'll say that uh, Victor and Andy stole my script. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. But I'm not going to hop off uh, off of that. Uh, I like it for all the reasons Victor mentioned, all the reasons Andy mentioned. I think Jamar Chase is due for a really big bounce back year this football season. And it certainly doesn't hurt that Joe Burrow is back healthy again. And Joe Burrow has made a promise to the football world and all the football fans that you're going to see a different Cincinnati Bengal and a different Joe Burrow this football season. All right. And then I'm going to uh, go with – uh, Saquon Barkley at 22 to one. Uh, I still think that there's, uh, I mean, he's still in the prime of his career. He's now on an Eagles team with a much better offensive line and a much better offense. And I just think people kind of forget sometimes about how, how good Barkley can be. If he could stay healthy, uh, I think he could have a really big year. So I'm going to go with Barkley at 22 to one. And, and, and another running back that I am not going to take, he is uh, on my team, but I think could have a fantastic season is Brees Hall. He is at 15 to 1. Um, but I think Barkley is just uh, in a much better situation. Okay. Uh, let's now go to, we only have a few more left. Uh, let's now uh, head to uh, offensive and defensive rookies of the year. So uh, we'll start with Victor. Who you got for defensive rookie of the year, Vic? Uh, we're going defensive. Is that what the question was? Yep. Defensive rookie of the year. Okay, well, let me see here. All right, I only see two players that are listed at less than 10 to 1 odds in this category. So, obviously, it's one in which there is some uh, terrific value if, of course, we hit on the right guy. Right now, of course, we got that two-player race between Latu of the Colts and uh, Turner of the Vikings. 
Uh, my pick is going to be a defensive lineman. And I like this kid's pedigree, My Byron Murphy of Seattle. I believe he's up there somewhere around 10 to 1 odds. Uh, not quite the two chalky players. There he is. He was the 16th pick, don't forget now, of the NFL draft in the first round. He was also the Big 12 defensive lineman of the year. And he's got every chance of making an impact uh, in this league. He's played a few years now at Texas. He should be ready for the big leagues. And I think the odds are overly generous on Byron Murphy. Yeah, and that's uh, I think if that does happen, it could give Seattle a really good chance uh, with Mike McDonald. He knows what he's doing, and he made a great pick there. Okay, uh, next up, Tony, who are you going to go with? Defensive Rookie of the Year. Definitely like Turner, definitely like Murphy. I will go with Jared Verse of the Rams. Great story. Started his career at Albany, then ended up at FSU. He's a game record last year, and he's uh, looked great in preseason. Obviously, there is a pass rushing uh, hole with uh, the Rams having lost Donald versus a different position. Obviously, he's not an interior lineman. He's more of an outside edge rusher, but he will make an impact. So, plus 1,100 for Jared Verse from FSU. All right. And in the books, Andy? You are mute, Andy? I, I was. I didn't realize it. I've, I've not been able to come with a, uh, a clear one because the odds are, you know, I, I mean, I like Lytel Lau, but at 425, that's not offering uh, really a lot of, uh, of, 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 of value with a lot of options there. I did consider both Burst and Murphy, and I think when I decided, I prefer Murphy. All right, so another uh, double here. We're going to go Murphy. Next up, Mark. Well, looking at this, I'm going to almost, almost echo Andy's sentiments here. Uh, I really, really like Latu Latu, but he's the favorite here. He's the chalk, and uh, friends don't let friends bet chalk. So, <laughs> Unless they're 8-1. to one. Uh, Well, yeah, if they're 8-1, to one, there's a lot of bad horses in Michigan. the field. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it, to me, it's between Byron Murphy and Jared Verse. Andy took Murphy. I'll take Verse. I think Verse has those big shoes to fill with the Rams, and he's got like size 14 feet. Jared Verse for me. All right. <laughs> so we've got uh, two Murphys and two Verses. So I guess I got to uh, pull the tiebreaker, and I won't because I'm not going to take either one. So I'm, I'm going to – there's a few other guys that I would go with um, uh, as far as uh, this award, and that is um, – I'm interested in Cooper Dezine, Peyton Wilson – um, I'm not going to go with them, but those are guys I'm interested in because I haven't seen DeGene yet. He's coming off the injury. I don't think he's even played yet. Uh, I also like long shots at 60-1, to like Lasseter, the corner, who's starting already for Houston, and Nealon, the edge rusher for Dallas, who's going to get a lot of opportunity this year. But I'm going to go with uh, one of my favorite players in the draft and one of my favorite players um, that I just fell in love with towards the end of last year, and that's Braden Fisk at 50-1, to and he's taking over the role basically that Mr. Darnold. Uh, had with the Rams, and so if the Rams are going to have that successful season, I think Fisk is going to be a big part of it. So, I think that's an excellent choice too. By the way, Greg, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm a big fan, and he's a big number too, at uh, fifty to one. So oh, that'll be my pick. Okay, now uh, let's see. We've got uh, five more minutes before Andy's got to leave, so uh, I think we might be able to make it. So let's go uh, offensive rookie of the year, and we're going to start with Vic. Well, guys, if you're looking for the hot guy, uh, earlier today, Bo Nix was named the starting quarterback of the Denver Broncos. And with that said, <coughs> excuse me, he opened up at plus 3,500 and is now down to plus 1,000, I believe. Yep. A lot of activity coming in on him. Time out a second here. Okay. Let me, I got a cough. You take your time. Tony, why don't you go ahead and take your pick while he coughs? Unmute. There you go. Uh, I will go Caleb Williams plus one thirty-five because he's going to win. But wow. for value sake, Malik Neighbors plus eleven hundred because he's going to be dynamic right out of the gate. But who's going to throw him the football? I don't trust Daniel Jones to stay healthy. But uh, Neighbors certainly has, uh, from everything that I've read, uh, looked dynamic in. Uh, in scrimmages and workouts with other teams. So worth a shot at plus 1,100. Again, though, everybody's playing for second because Caleb Williams is going to win this award. Well, then just if that's the case, then I think the advice would be don't don't bet it. So, 
uh, are you, you know, you know me with futures. My 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 take on football futures too easy to get injured, so I, I wouldn't bet most of these. Yeah, well, that's the thing, though. It's uh, yeah, futures. Just a yeah, that's the advice because of the fact that what are you going to wait in four months, five months to make money on an even bet? It's just uh, it's not good uh, finances. All right, uh, are you good there? Go to go, Vic. I am, and uh, while I agree that uh, Caleb Williams should be the favorite in this particular category, uh, betting him at, what, plus 135, plus 40, this should not feel like substantial value. On the flip side, Jaden Daniels, we talked about him a couple of weeks ago when we were discussing the NFC East division. No, he will likely not lead the commanders to the postseason, but he's got the dual threat the playmaking upside to have a massive season and crash the rookie party. So give him to me at odds right around five to one odds. All right. I like that. And yes, this, see, that's part of the reason why I, I, I wouldn't, my, my personally, I wouldn't go with Caleb Williams because I think Jaden Daniels is going to have a chance to actually overshine him. Um, but, uh, you know, again, uh, Caleb Williams is getting all the hype as far as the, the odds makers. I mean, of, as far as the experts are concerned, and that could screw things up. All right, uh, Andy, let's go ahead with your next two picks because I know you got to run. So first, who is your uh, rookie offensive player of the year? Well, I went with uh, Murray as one of my considerations for the um, comeback player. Went with Gannon as coach of the year, so it's only uh, logical that I go with Marvin Harrison Jr. as rookie of the year. That makes a lot of sense. Sitting there at almost seven to one, and why don't you go ahead, uh, Andy, and give us your MVP? Well, once again, I'll probably have to look at a quarterback. And um, although the odds of the Super Bowl favorites are it's extremely low, uh, as you would expect, especially given the history of quarterbacks, I almost can make a case for Jordan Love because I do think the Packers are going to make it as far as the NFC Championship game this year, but they might not be able to uh, to make it into the Super Bowl. Uh, I do like Joe Burrow. I think 9-1, to one, and you, Mark talked about uh, his attitude this year. Again, it, uh, as with all of these, it depends upon health, and if Joe Burrow is healthy, I think, I think he and Jamar Chase do put up big numbers. I'll go with uh, Joe Burrow. All right, and also keep in mind, uh, Andy has uh, uh, Justin Herbert as comeback player. Justin Herbert is thirty to one to win the MVP. So uh, we'll see, because uh, that could be interesting. If he's that good to win comeback player of the year, I wonder whether or not he'll. Uh, you would think he'd get votes for MVP as well. So, and much better odds. Well, well, if if he wins, if he wins player of the year. Well, you know what? I, again, I don't know where a lot of play, you know DraftKings may be one of the few places that has this many players on comeback of the year. So he might not be able to. You might not be able to wager on him. But certainly, if he wins MVP, you'd have to think he'd be in contention for comeback player. All right, Andy. Appreciate it. We know you got to run, and we'll talk to you next week when we preview college football. I'll look forward to it, and I'll get you that college list tomorrow. Hey, Andy. So, uh, thanks so much. Be well. We'll catch you next week. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. All right, so uh, let's see. I think, Mark, you're next, I believe, right? All right, for Offensive Rookie of the Year, I'm going to go with Xavier Worthy. Uh, I think he fills a perfect spot in Kansas City, especially with the Rice situation being what it is. And fastest player in the Combines, uh, I think he fits like a glove into Patrick Mahomes and what it is that he wants to do. Uh, I also was was going to consider uh, Jaden Daniels, uh, if for no other reason that uh, Washington – uh, had the worst turnover ratio in the league last year. And guys, if you look at a chart of the teams that had the worst turnover ratio, most turnovers, I should say, in the National Football League this year, they bounce back incredibly the next year. Uh, so too does the team's record bounce back. And that then, in this case, would be Jaden Daniels leading the Washington Commanders. Okay. And then my pick, uh, I was uh, also taking a look at ones you talked about, Daniels, Bo Nix, Worthy, uh, but again, trying to get some uh, real value here. I'm going to go with Brian Thomas Jr. at 50 to one. Uh, one thing that uh, Trevor Lawrence has done well at, and that's throw the deep ball. And Thomas uh, had a fantastic year last year in college, along with Jaden Daniels, who you spoke about, the quarterback now of Washington. So, I think Brian Thomas Jr. is major value because if you're going to if you're going to tell me Malik Neighbors is 11 to one. 
with uh, with Jones at quarterback, and I can get Brian Thomas at fifty to one with Trevor Lawrence. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. So, all right. So now let's uh, wrap it all up with the MVP. We already have Andy's, and I know Jim's been waiting. So Jim, you're back. So give us your MVP for the 2024 season. I spoke very highly of um, the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell, what they did last year. D Jared Goff has played very well. He's been to a Super Bowl. He's almost got to one last year. Uh, we're not, you know, the, he, he, he's been playing very great. His confidence level since going to Detroit and the support that he's got there, he's a different player. And he's very, very good at what he does. They have good balance on offense. I like Jared Goff to be the most valuable player and take him to the Super Bowl. Awesome. Jared Goff. Wouldn't that be uh, a nice story? It's already a nice story. All right. Jared Goff is your pick, Jim. Vic, who do you have for MVP? Well, we know it's going to be a quarterback, right? There's only been four <laughs> non-quarterback winners dating all the way back to 2000. And those four, Marshall Falk, Sean Alexander, LaDainian Tomlinson, and Adrian Peterson were running backs who won it more than a decade ago. So uh, don't bet on non-quarterbacks in this category unless, like, you enjoy setting money on fire. So there you go. <laughs> My top of the board best bet is a guy I talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were previewing the AFC East division, and that's going to be Josh Allen. Currently plus 850s, uh, slightly ahead of Joe Burrows at plus 9 to 1 odds. Fifth place last year, and uh, Josh Allen got the only non-Lamar Jackson first place vote. In 2022, Josh Allen finished third in the voting and got one of only two non-Mahomes votes. Clearly, the MVP voters are willing to reward Allen if he plays at a high level and B, if he wins his respective division in the process. Josh Allen. All right, there you go. By the way, uh, Miles My Garrett, I know how, how high you guys are on him as Defensive Player of the Year, just to show you this. Can you believe he's 200 to 1? Oh, my goodness. I mean, he wins Defensive Player of the Year. He could win it again this year like you guys uh, predicted, and yet 200 to 1 to win MVP. It's like well, Lawrence was, Taylor for the Giants being 200 to 1. You know, yeah. the same, you know, the it's same almost situation. like you have to bet 25 or $50 on it just for the hell of it. <laughs> yeah, right. right? <laughs> I mean, the same thing with Christian McCaffrey, who if any running back is going to win it again, you would think McCaffrey would be the guy at 40 to 1. But he didn't win it last year. so And, and, and they had already given the award to Jackson. So if you would have thought that would have been the perfect year to give it to McCaffrey, and they still didn't do it. Okay, next up, Tony. Right, I'm going to be the uh, the NFL future Scrooge here. Uh, <laughs> because I'll remind everybody, because it's, it really is nice to talk about 50 to 1 winners and all that, but only one person wins, and it's the person who actually wins the award. So from that standpoint, you know, we see what Caleb Williams is expected to do. We see how he's playing in the preseason. There's going to be value on him at even money, even though you don't want to tie up your money that way. The same way that there's going to be value, or there was, uh, when you could have bet Victor Wembanyama to win an NBA Rookie of the Year uh, when it was him and Chet Holmgren before the All-Star break at even money, and that ended up being a landslide. My MVP pick is Lamar Jackson, again, coming off of a 13-3 and year where he was the NFL MVP. At plus 1,800, he's got you know, better odds than, uh, or higher odds, a better payout than CJ Stroud who'd be on my list. Uh, Jordan Love would be on my list because at that point, if those two guys take their teams to even higher levels than they did last year, they'll certainly be in the conversation. But I expect Zay Flowers to be better. I expect the Ravens to continue to throw the ball. I certainly don't think that Lamar Jackson, having figured some things out in the passing game, will regress just yet. So given plus 1,800 uh, and winning a, the toughest division in football, or, or arguably, yeah. I, I will say Lamar is uh, definitely worthy. And, I mean, to have Aaron Rodgers at plus 1,600 ahead of the reigning MVP to me is, is funny. But 
uh, that is my call on that. Yeah, I would have to think that uh, Lamar is not the favorite because he's got two already. I, right. I'd, I'd have to think, yeah, that otherwise he'd, he'd probably be up there at five to one or something. So, but yeah, yeah getting good it, value. He should, be, he, he should be in Mahomes territory, and Mahomes is in Mahomes territory. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, from that standpoint, at plus 1,800, I think uh, it, it's worth it, it checks both boxes, both the value and the fact that he, uh, performance wise, he can get there. All right. Next up is Mark. Mark. Well, I got to admit this, uh, guys. I hate to admit this, but uh, I did what Victor said not to do last year, and I burned a pile of money when I bet Christian McCaffrey to win the MVP last year. And I really, truly thought going down the stretch, it was going to be one of those rare running backs that was going to steal an award like that, but it didn't work out. It didn't happen. You won't find me doing that again. (laughs) Instead, uh, I'm going to go to Joe Burrow, who, uh, as I mentioned before, he has a sight set as as high as anybody I've ever seen as far as wanting to come back from an injury to do just that. I have the Browns and the Bengals battling toe-to-toe right down to the wire in the AFC North. And if it ends up being just that way, I think Joe Burrow will win a lot of votes. I have Joe Burrow for my MVP. All right, there you go. Yeah, if he stays healthy, he's going to have a monster season. So uh, that is a a very uh, understandable pick for Joe Burrow. Um, let's just hope his offensive line can keep him healthy. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up with uh, there's a few guys that uh, uh, I was uh, considering that uh, have been taken, but I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. See, I'm not going to take Justin Herbert only because I took Harbaugh, so I don't want to go all in, but I will say that I think Herbert's good value. So if, if, if you're somebody who doesn't believe in taking Harbaugh because his number's too low, then I'd say go ahead and take Herbert because he's 30 to one based on the Chargers having a really good year. Um, but I'm going to go ahead though and come down to your guys' level of not going too crazy here and take Love at 14 to one. Uh, he had such a great second half of the season. I see no reason why that won't continue. Uh, the receivers there are just awesome. He's got the best group of young receivers in football. Uh, I, I just see that they're going to be better. Um, I, I know Mark believes that they're going to come down a little bit, but um if they don't, and this is the next step, then uh, then that means that Jordan Love is going to be a big part of that. So I'll take him at fourteen to one. Hey guys, I got to tell you this: uh, Greg hosts uh, quite a few shows, and one of them is a, a racing show with John Hardoon and Chad Summer. A really, really great racing show where they make picks and predictions, and Greg takes part of that. And he makes his predictions with them as well, and. You, all you need to know about Greg is he will be looking at every horse that's at least 10 to 1 and probably <laughs> 20 or, to one or better. <laughs> yeah. okay? And so hence, I'm looking at all of the selections here, and I'm going right away to the guys that are 10 to 1 and are going to be a big bang for their buck. And I'm really rather surprised, Greg, that you made the choice here at 14 to 1. Yes. Really well, that's why I said. That's why I threw Herbert out there at 30, <laughs> just in case. It. Uh, All right, so uh, Mark, that's going to wrap it up uh, for this segment. And then uh, next week, we're going to talk college football. We're going to love it here next week. We're going to do just that. We'll do our college football prediction show next week. We might even have some college football player props. We'll talk with Greg, and we'll see what we put together that way. But uh, I think Jim will be taking the week off next week, so we'll have the other cast and crew of our experts here to do our college football prediction show for the cast of experts here on the Against the Spread podcast. Until next week, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always. Thanks, guys.